Greetings, everyone. This is Jeff Wilkerson, professor of physics at Luther College, bringing you the next in our series of what to look for in the night sky. We're talking about the week of November 18 this time around. Uh, on the morning of the 18th, maybe you've heard something about Leonid meteors, a lot of moonlight. Uh, the Leonid meteor shower is one of these showers that typically doesn't have many meteors. Uh, we have these very rare outburst years, meteor storm years, but uh, with as much moon as around, you're outside, look up, see if you see any of these things on early on Monday morning before sunrise. I, you know, why not look up when you're outside? I just, just take, take a look at what you see up there, but don't expect much from this meteor shower. In the evening sky, we've got Venus. Now, we've been talking. Last week, we talked about Mars in prograde motion, which means it's moving easterly against the background stars, and it was headed toward the Beehive Cluster in Cancer, and still doing that, and keep an eye on it this week. Keep watching Mars tracking toward the Beehive Cluster, and next week, and the week after, and the week after, all right? It, Mars is moving moving toward Cancer, the heart of Cancer, with this beautiful Beehive open star cluster in there. Uh, and Jupiter and Saturn, we've been watching this entire fall, and they've been now in retrograde motion for quite a while, moving uh, to the west against the background stars, and so... Venus is also in prograde motion. So with Mars, Venus is in prograde motion. It's a the big bright object in the evening sky. Get out right after sunset. Sunset's early right now for those of us here in the northern hemisphere. If you're watching from the southern hemisphere, uh, congratulations as you're as you're headed towards summer there. But the um, see Venus is the big bright dot just after sunset in the southwest. It's going to be the biggest brightest thing there. And Venus is in prograde motion, moving easterly against the background stars. And right now, this week, it's passing, pa passing by Nunki, uh, which is one of the handle stars in uh, the, the, the teapot asterism of Sagittarius. Nunki is a bright star. It's a 2.0 magnitude star. So you, you might be able to see this whole region. This whole region right now, Venus is, as, as Venus is in prograde motion, it's getting further and further away from the sun and staying up later and later after sunset, getting easier and easier to see. And as it does so, you know, it sets right now. So where we are right now is it sets about two and a half hours after sunset. That allows it to get pretty good. Now, you still have to look through a lot of atmosphere and low on the horizon, so it's not great. But my guess is 45 minutes after sunset, an hour after sunset, you should have no trouble seeing Nunki uh, right there, this star in in. in this star in Sagittarius. And so ab above there, while, while you're there in the dark, hold, let's come back to Nunki. Let's hold that thought. There are two beautiful, beautiful globular clusters up there. You've got M20, M22 and M28 as your globular star clusters that are just above Venus, uh, right up in here. So you go out and you look at Venus and, and say, on the night of the 22nd, look, look just a degree or so above Venus if you've got your binoculars or your small telescope. Now, we're really digging deep through the atmosphere for this. We don't go out and we don't look for globular star clusters this time of year. This is a summertime thing. It's not a, it's not a, a, a November kind of thing. But there's Venus guiding the way. Find Venus, look a degree up and a degree over to the right, and see if you can see, uh, look particularly for M22 that sits right above Venus right there as Venus tracks uh, to the east above Nunki. Uh, so so there's, a good, there's a good deep sky object for you. You got your telescope or your binoculars and give that a try. Your binoculars, if you have trouble seeing Nunki even in the glow of sunset or the thickness of, of the atmosphere as you're looking to the west, your binoculars are going to help you here. So Nunki at 2.0 magnitude is, uh, is, is considered somewhere around the 50th brightest star. By that point, you know, okay, let's stop for a second. Uh, we can see a few thousand stars on the nighttime sky. That's out of the 200 billion or so that are in our Milky Way. These are the ones we can see on the night sky if we got a really good dark sky and, and, and we look. Uh, so this is way up there. This is among the brighter stars in the sky. Uh, but by that time, you get down here to 2.0 magnitude, and you might start to have arguments about, well, this is 2.02 .02 versus 2.01 or 2.05 versus 2.04. And so not everybody's going to agree exactly where this star ranks. Uh, but it's, it's 49th or 50th brightest star in the sky. Uh, so it's a pretty bright star. Again, use your binoculars if you need to, but watch Venus. Venus is tracking. By the 24th and the 25th, Venus has scooted on off uh, to, to the east and as well away from Nunki. But see if you can watch that track this week. It's a good week to watch Venus moving there. And check out M22 uh, sitting, the globular cluster, the bright globular cluster that sits right above Venus as it does this tracking. Uh, the, so, Nunki is about 225 light years distance from us, 
And you see people say that it's about 3,000 times. Uh, usually everywhere you go and you look, it'll say it's 3,300 times the luminosity of the sun. So it's 3,300 times brighter than the sun. I don't know really how well we know that number, right? I'm not sure that we have that number that, that well known to be able to say 3,300, but somewhere on the order of 3,000 times brighter than the sun. And it's about seven and a half to eight times the mass of the sun. And so it's a pretty massive star. It's a B star in the, in the classification stars. And those, are, those aren't real common uh, to be that massive. There can be significantly more massive stars. But this allows us to see that we've got, um, on, in the main sequence, it's a main sequence star. It's fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. And these main sequence stars that fuse hydrogen and helium in their core, as they get to be more massive, that mass pushes down. And you need more pressure, radiation pressure and gas pressure pushing out. And the way you get that is higher temperature. The higher temperature is a higher pressure. I mean, you can think about this the reverse way. You can think about as you press down, gravitational potential energy gets converted to thermal energy and makes uh, a higher temperature pushing up. And all of this leads to a higher rate of nuclear reactions in the core to support that luminosity. So the star glows more. The star glows, you can think about it that way. The star glows more that, that because it's got a higher pressure and the higher pressure leads to a higher temperature. Higher temperature means higher luminosity, end of story. But to maintain that luminosity, you need something feeding energy into the system and that's the nuclear fusion. That's the hydrogen being converted into helium in the core. And the rate of those reactions is not linear. As the temperature doubles, you get a lot more uh, than two times as many nuclear reactions. So you get a lot more energy out. And that's the same for the, 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 the temperature relationship too. So making eight times more massive leads to something like 3,000 times more luminous because it's not a linear relationship between mass and uh, the temperature increase and the native rate of nuclear reaction increase. So this is, a, this is a big luminous star, fun star to think about as you're watching Venus slide past there. Remember to look for uh, M22. I drew that circle right there, but M22 is a beautiful globular cluster. Uh, that sits right above Venus as it's doing this. Uh, there's a couple others in the area, too, as we mentioned. Uh, check that out if you've got your telescopes out. Do this uh, shortly after dark. Uh, let it get darker just as soon as it's just dark enough to be able to start to see things like that. Now, the moon is also, of course, tracking uh, to the east against the background stars. It's a, it's a fairly bright moon week. By the end of the week, it gets to be pretty good. Uh, it's 80 to 90 percent full on the evening of the 18th and the 19th. There's Castor and Pollux, the twin stars. The moon is down here. Mars is over here. So we got Castor, Pollux, and Mars is the bright object that's right there. The moon's going to shoot right through there. It's going to pass between the 18th and 19th, 80 to 90 percent full. It's almost right in a line. It's almost a line between Ca uh, Pollux and Mars on the 19th to the 20th. And then it will have scooted on out this direction by the 20th into the 21st. Uh, evening of the 20th, morning of the 21st, it's down to about two-thirds full, and it's off to the east of the Castor Pollux Mars uh, little little pattern right there. So watch that happen midweek and the moon fades away. By the 22nd, evening of the 22nd, in the morning of the 23rd, the moon is about half full, and it sits close to bright star Regulus. Regulus is the star that's in the base of the backward question mark, the sickle of Leo. So it's that bright star right there, and the moon will be sitting Pretty close to that that morning. By the by the 24th, even in the 24th, in the morning of the 25th, we're down to less than one-third full. So that becomes a morning object at that point. Well, all of this is going on. Jupiter is in retrograde motion toward uh, the star Iota Tari. It's a 4.6 magnitude star. Uh, you should be able to see it. If you've got a dark sky, you should be able to see it without any optical aid. Binoculars are going to pull it out like that for you. So Jupiter is closing in. We've talked about Mars. Mars closing in on the, the beehive star cluster, this beautiful open star cluster in Cancer. We're watching Venus slide past a bright star, Nunki, in uh, the handle of the, the teapot asterism of Sagittarius. And now we can, think, we can see Jupiter tracking toward Iota Tauri, and we want to keep an eye on it this weekend and next week, and maybe the week after that, because it's, it's going right, right at it. And it's closing. By the, when the week opens, Jupiter is about one and two-thirds degrees away to the east of Iota Tauri, and it's inside one degree. It's somewhere on the order of about nine-tenths of a degree uh, away by the time the week ends. And the next week, it's, good. <laughs> it's just going to close right down. Uh, so this is a great thing. Start drawing start pictures. Go out, make little sketches. Use your binoculars to, to look at it. Uh, use your naked eye if you don't have the binoculars and you have a dark enough sky. And, and watch Jupiter closing down. Great observing project. See if you can enjoy that. Uh, Jupiter is, remember, in the, the heart of Taurus. 
So Jupiter's the big bright object coming up uh, just after dark. By, by 7 o'clock, Jupiter has, for me and for most of you probably, depending on where you are, Jupiter has crawled over the eastern horizon, and it's the biggest, brightest star crawling over the eastern horizon. It's in the, you've got the V of the Hyades with big, bright Aldebaran there. And it's out in here someplace that, for these stars that you see. And what I've been enjoying this week, and so I'll throw that out there for you to look at. About 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, all of this has moved over toward the west and is thinking about setting by 6 o'clock in the morning. So Jupiter's rising. It's not close to setting yet, but it's, it's, it's past the meridian, it, it, meridian. It's on the setting side of the sky. So Jupiter's rising just after dark, uh, a couple hours after dark right now. Jupiter should make an appearance in the evening sky. By morning, it's crossed the meridian line and you're watching it settle into the west. But as it gets light, as I walk to work at about 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm watching the sky glow start to wash out the stars. And as the sky glow glow starts to wash out the stars, the bright star that remain, Jupiter's right there, uh, looking to the south east, that southwest, excuse me, Aldebaran, the big bright orange Aldebaran is down there, and the big bright red Betelgeuse is down there, and this is a beautiful triangle, and for a while, fainter than those other objects is Bellatrix, the other shoulder, that's a shoulder star in Orion, the other shoulder star in Orion is Bellatrix, and it, it sits just below that line that connects Aldebaran to Betelgeuse, and I've been watching that every morning, it's been clear for me in the morning, it's not, not the last couple, but prior to that, uh, as I've been walking to work, and I can see uh, this star that sits just below that line. Bellatrix will disappear first, uh, then Betelgeuse and Aldebaran. Aldebaran will disappear slightly before Betelgeuse, but they'll go around, uh, they'll disappear about the same time as the sky gets brighter, and then, then Jupiter uh, winks out as the star reaches its, its morning brightness. So that's what we got. It's a big week. They're all big weeks. We say it every week, right? There's always something fun to see. Lots of Right now, there's just so many planets moving relative to so many things that we can watch planets moving to the west, we can watch planets moving to the east, and see all of these things tracking down through there. But it should be a good week. As always, everybody, thanks for watching, and have a great week ahead.